Hello, everyone. I want you to imagine that you have come into work one day, and you've been told that you need to write an application in a language that you don't know in a single day, and you've got lots of competing priorities, like me, and you've got to get it done. <laughs> it's enough to make your hair go gray, right? Um, so today we're going to talk about Amazon Q and how Amazon Q developer can help you meet those deadlines and write that code that you don't know. I'm Michelle Chisman, and I'm a senior solutions architect at AWS. And with no further ado, let's dive in. So this is going to be a live demo. So everyone, pray to the demo gods, and we'll see that this all goes well. So Amazon Q is our large language model um, assistant. It's a conversational assistant that you can have live in your IDE, helping you to write code and build infrastructure. You install this using um, one of the extensions. Right here, I'm in Visual Studio Code, but it also supports the JetBrains IDEs as well. And once you've installed Amazon Q, you would just search for Amazon Q, go ahead and install it, very simple. And then you'll see this icon down here at the left-hand side, which is the Q symbol. And when we open that, we then get this, video, uh, this image here, which is our chat interface. Sometimes it'll open a chat for you automatically. That's fine. And it looks something like this. Now, Amazon Q has several different ways of interacting with it. And today, I'm going to really focus on this chat interface. And if we get time in a little bit, I'll show you some of the other ways that you can interact with it in the um, inline code suggestions as well. So in this chat interface, you can just ask questions of Amazon Q. So say, for example, you wanted to know um, what are the steps. You know what? I'm just going to copy and paste rather than try and write live. So I've got my prompts here. So what are the steps for creating um, a Lambda or a Python application? And so Amazon Q then goes ahead and figures out how to answer the question. And you'll see quite quickly we get a response here that gives us some really nice step-by-step -step instructions on how to set up a Python environment, following best practices, even providing code snippets that we can use to then go ahead and start building a Python application. So it's a really nice feedback mechanism quickly within your IDE so you don't have to go to Google to try and figure out what you're doing. But actually, one of the more powerful ways of using Q is by using the agents. So if we type forward slash here, we see a list of the different agents that we can use to invoke on Amazon Q, right? And so if any of you have used Q so far, Q for developer, you'll have seen that this list was much shorter until yesterday. And several new features were added yesterday. And we'll touch on a couple of them as we go through this talk. So Transform has been around for a while. And this is allowing you to modernize your Java code. So you can take your Java 8 or 11 code and upgrade it. And it will do all the transformation for you to try and help accelerate those code transformations and those modernization processes. But the one I'm going to focus on to begin with is this dev agent. Now, the dev agent is very similar to the uh, chat interface. You're going to t give it a prompt. You're going to tell it to do something. But slightly different to the chat interface, it's actually going to make the changes for you. It's not just going to make suggestions. It can actually write to your files, create new files, and even delete files on your behalf. So it's a little bit more powerful than just interacting with the chat. So we're going to build an application. And I'm going to show you just how quickly it is to go from absolutely nothing to a full working application using this. So I'm going to build an application using Python 3.12. I want to deploy it to AWS using the serverless application model. And we'll touch on that in a moment. We're going to make sure that the dice is restricted to between 1 and 6. Otherwise, it can just go a bit wild. And we'll end up with like 100-sided dice sometimes. Um, and we're going to say that it's accessible behind an API. I'm not saying exactly how it's going to be accessible. We're going to leave it up to um, Q to decide that. And then I'm asking it to create an endpoint of that endpoint so that it can curl that endpoint when we're ready. So I'm just going to copy that and paste that here. 
So now we have a, um, a box here that's just going to update as it figures out what it's going to do. So it's really doing um, a lot of heavy lifting here. And it'll say that it can it take a few minutes. And if we drill down into what's actually going on here, Q is asking an LLM what are the reasonable steps that it needs to do in order to complete this task. It's then getting those steps back and it's validating those steps and it's going, is, is this something that makes sense? Can I do this? And then it'll go through those steps one by one, performing the tasks, and then checking that that task actually meets the requirements set out in the original prompt. Now, best practices for this then, as you can imagine, it does take some time. So don't have large code bases if you're wanting to do this, because you could be there for quite a while waiting for it to go through your large code base. Sometimes it has to open every single file in a directory in order to figure out what is actually useful for its context and what isn't. So if you've got hundreds of files, you'll be waiting for a while. But when you're building something small and scrappy, this is fantastic. And so you can see this box here is updating. And so it's going to tell you transparently exactly what it's doing as it makes the changes. And it's going to update in live form in this one single box so you don't have to keep scrolling through an entire chat window to keep up with what's going on. It then gives you an overview of the files that it's reviewed, the files that it's created, um, changed or deleted, so that you can keep track of what it's doing. And then eventually, once it completes, we'll get a window down here, well-timed, um, that actually shows the changes that have been made. And so in this case, it's saying that we're going to add two new files. We're going to add our Python file. And quite convincingly, we have a single line of code, which is just rolling a random number between 1 and 6. Great. That's what we want. Then we have our infrastructure as code file. Now, this is obviously CloudFormation, but it looks slightly different to CloudFormation because it's actually formatted for the serverless application model for SAM. So instead of seeing AWS Lambda function, we're seeing AWS serverless function. This just makes things a little bit easier when you're deploying serverless applications because it simplifies how to deploy certain bits of infrastructure. For example, in this Lambda function, we can immediately build in an API to this definition for the Lambda function without having to define separate resources for every single piece in there. And this is going to deploy an IAM role, an API gateway, and a Lambda function for us in just 17 lines of code. So it's just a little bit more compact and a little bit simpler than the CloudFormation, um, which is why we love to use SAM. OK, so this looks fine to me. <laughs> we'll see when we deploy whether it works. But I'm going to accept those changes. And when I accept those changes, if I go here into my directory now, I'm seeing my new file app.py, and I'm seeing my new file template.yaml. So that's great. We've got everything here. So let's deploy it. So I'm going to deploy using SAM. And the first thing we do is we do the SAM build. And SAM build just makes sure that everything in the files is correct, it's functioning, and um, that, that there's no syntax errors that we need to be concerned about. And convincingly, this looks good. We have a build succeed. So we're now going to go ahead and deploy. And we're going to use the guided method for this. So it's just going to ask us um, some prompts as it goes along so we fill in some details. So we're going to keep the standard naming, SAM app, US East 1. Um, I'm just going to hit some defaults here. I don't want to disable rollback. That's OK. And no, that's fine. OK. So what we see here now is the deployment happening. And this is very familiar to you if you've been using CloudFormation. We're deploying a stack. So in this box here, we're going to see the change set. We're going to see what's being created. And then we're going to see the CloudFormation status updates as that then updates in the console. And it'll update live. And obviously, it's CloudFormation. So it, it can take a couple of minutes to deploy. And whilst we're waiting for that to deploy, we'll just quickly take a look at this um, app.py. And we'll um, show you some of the other things that are really useful in Q. So if we highlight some of this code, and we right click here. Oh, that's tiny. OK. Trust me when I say there is an item in here that says Amazon Q. And if we scroll down to Amazon Q, there's a sub menu with a, a lot of other different features that we can do. So we can explain what this code means. And if I click that, it will open Q. 
and it will generate an answer to explain what that piece of code is doing. So if you're ever working with a code base that you aren't familiar with, then you can immediately highlight some code and get an answer as to what's happening there. If we go down back again, we've got refactor and we've got fix. So if you're aware that there's an issue with the code, Q can make some suggestions and it can even make some um, edits to your files to actually fix any problems that you have in there. So it's a really useful tool. But our CloudFormation has now deployed. So I'm going to take this URL here and we're just going to curl that URL and all being well, we get a rollback. So the code is working, the IAC has been created successfully, it has deployed successfully, and we've not yet actually done any coding ourselves. Now we get that this is a simple application, right? Um, it, it is a line of code, so, but it scales, and you can create more complicated pieces of code and more complicated applications to, to do the features that you need to bring to, um, to production. Okay. So let's, let's pretend that this is actually more complicated than it is. Um, if, if you're building any code, you want to make sure that it's documented well. How many of you have come to a code base that you're unfamiliar with and it's not been documented? Yeah. It's one of the most frustrating things as a developer that you'll ever have to deal with. And you spend way more time trying to figure out what's going on than you realistically need to. So, Originally, I was going to do in this demo the forward slash dev, and then I was going to ask it to document the code for me. Um, and that worked really nicely. But if you were watching the keynote yesterday, you'll have seen that a new agent has been released to do exactly that, to document your repo. So let's go and try a new agent. So we're going to close these down chats. And we're going to open a new one. I've got my um, app.py right here for it to document and we're gonna to go to doc. And when we go to doc, we don't actually need to provide any further input. We just hit enter. And when we hit enter, we get a couple of options to select. So the first option is create a readme, and the second is update an existing readme. We don't have a readme, so obviously I'm gonna select create a readme. And it's just going to double check that the project I want to do it for is this, this project here. And I'm gonna click yes. And once again, it's going to go through that process of figuring out what it needs to do, breaking things out step by step, and then performing the job that's in front of it. And this box looks a little bit different. Um, obviously, new feature, there's a new layout, but it's still doing the same thing. It's saying that it's scanning the source files, in which case, this is just a very simple app.py. Um, it's going to summarize them, and then it's going to write that documentation. And again, it can take a couple of minutes. Um, in the experimentations with this in the last 24 hours, it can take somewhere between two to four minutes, um, depending on um, how it's feeling on the day to day. Um, but whilst that's running, I'm going to show you another agent so that we're not waiting around for it to finish. So we're going to go again to here, we're going to forward slash, and we're going to do test. So you all hate undocumented code. How many of you dislike writing unit tests? Yeah. Um, I'm not very creative, so I don't really think well in a testing framework way. And so when this was announced, I was incredibly excited. Um, this is a simple, simple Lambda function, but there are still ways in which it could go wrong. So we want to make sure that it's tested. We want to make sure that we've got unit tests for it. So we're going to go ahead and have the agent write some, some unit tests for us. So the function that we're going to do it for is our Lambda handler. And we're going to hit Enter. And now it's, oh, there we go. We know that the other one's finished. So the agent for the unit test is now actually going to analyze the code, and it's going to write as many different tests as it can think of so that we can test this one particular piece of code. So while that's happening, that actually goes quite quickly. Um, we're going to go to our readme here. If we go to our original chat with the agent for generating documentation, it now says that it's finished. It's opened the file for us to review. If I just close that down, we can see that we now have a thoroughly formatted readme file that has the tree of all of the items in the, in the uh, directory, explains what each of those files does, explains how to use and how to deploy the infrastructure and how to actually call the API. 
And again, we've not actually had to write that down. We've not had to do that boring task of writing down documentation. It's been done for us. Um, so this is actually really, really exciting. So we're going to accept those changes. And when we do that, we'll now see that our readme file has been created. It's in the um, document. And then we can preview it in Markdown. Now, if we go back to our tests, that's now finished. And so it's created a new file for us called test app pi. And if we open this file or view the diff, we can now see that it's written an entirely new file with many, many different um, unit tests and about 89 lines of code, which for a single line of a Lambda function, that feels a bit excessive. But hey, it's going to be a really safe Lambda function now. Um, it's going to be well tested, and nothing's going to go wrong when we put this through our um, PyTest. But speaking of PyTest, let's see if this works. Like, It's one thing to write the, the tests. It's quite another for those tests to succeed or actually do what they say on the tin. So let's give it a go. Um, I'm going to open my terminal. And I am going to do its test app.py. So let's do pytest test app.py. Let's see what happens. Not there. Excellent. Is that because I've not accepted the file? It is. There we go. So now I've accepted the file. Hopefully that should work better. It does not work better. Ah, here we go. OK, what's going on? Where am I? I'm in queue. It's in test. There we go. That's why. Right. It's created it in its own directory. There we go. OK, so we have more errors. Um, but we can see that we've only got one error. And the no module is called queue demo. So obviously, something's in our test somewhere where it's referencing queue demo here in our um, import. Um, and that's not working well. And this, folks, is why you always sanity check what comes out of generative AI. Okay, um, So this happens from time to time. Um, some things that I've seen happen, particularly with Node, for example, it will try and pull in like the entire SDK. And in Node 18, you can't do that anymore in Lambda. You've got to pull in specific modules. But the LLM doesn't necessarily have that context, and so it tries to do it anyway. So this is why we sanity check. Now, I'm not going to bore you all by trying to debug this. Um, it is one of my favorite things to do, but that's not what you're here to see. Okay? Um, so <laughs> it didn't quite go to plan, and that's OK. But we still now, I mean, if, if we consider the fact that the issue here is just a, an import error, we still have got tests written. And even if it didn't work, it still gives us an idea, if you're not familiar with unit testing, how unit tests should be structured, what you should be unit testing, which is great if you've never done it and you need to learn and you, know, you don't necessarily find Googling helpful because you don't really know what to Google. So this gives you a starting point that you can experiment with. Sorry? Yes. So actually, you can ask Q to then try and fix it. Um, and sometimes it's really good at it. Um, and I've definitely had that where, um, certainly with bash commands, when they get really complicated and you're piping into various different um, other commands, it gets really useful at fixing that. You've just got to be careful that it doesn't then start to go around in circles with context. Because it feeds your entire conversation into the context. If it thinks it got an answer right at some point, it will think that answer is correct for the rest of that conversation, even if it's not. So if you do start finding you have those loops, break out of it, start a new conversation, and try again. And that, that's not just Q. That's any LLM. I found that with Claude. I found that with ChatGPT. OK, so that's pretty much a, a whistle stop tour of Amazon Q today and how you can build applications. It's been 20 minutes, and we have covered how to build an application without touching any code. We've had some limited success with testing, but it has written tests for us. And we've done that within 20 minutes. So you know that could have been a full day of work. It could have been longer, depending on your skill level. Um, so this just greatly accelerates. And I find that I use it every day. But go away. Try it yourself. See what you find. See what features work for you. What works, what doesn't work. And you know, if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn and tell me something cool that you found, let me know. I'd love to hear it. Thank you for listening.